Hey everybody, Matt from 90thPercentile.ca here. For access to more study notes, practice questions, mock exams, and end chapter question videos, visit 90thPercentile.ca and sign up for your free trial today. Link below in the description. For applications of financial statement analysis, this module is really just a, you know, a summary of everything that we went over over the last call it eight or nine modules. Um, no new concepts are presented here. It's kind of just wrapping everything up. And we're provided some examples but in some questions related to some risks associated with businesses and financial reporting and credit credit quality. We're also going to look at some ratios, talk about some adjustments that we can make to financial reports and also some inventory valuation measures. I just want to stress that <clears throat> this inventory valuation, like the FIFO and the LIFO, pops up in almost every module that we've that we've looked at. So I just really want to stress that this is really important on exam day. You know, it's pretty much something related to this is pretty much guaranteed to be on the exam, so we've got to make sure we understand it. But like I said, no new concepts here. There's only you know a few end of chapter questions, so we'll go through it pretty quick and Hopefully everything should be relatively smooth given that it's uh, it's just a summary. So let's jump right in. Credit analysts are likely to consider which of the following in making a rating recommendation. So credit analysts, the ones that are assigning ratings, um, so like the S&P, Moody's, Fitches of the world, um, they're assigning ratings to credit quality of a company. So they're gonna be looking at business risk by not, but not financial risk. No, financial risk, but not business risk. No, they're gonna have to look at both. So financial risk, concerning you know capacity to repay collateral all of that and then business risk is the risk of inherent in the business model and the industry etc when screening for potential equity investments based on return on equity to control risk an analyst would most likely include a criteria that requires positive net income negative net income or negative shareholders equity so these this screening um you know typically analysts will use some sort of software, maybe like Capital IQ to do a quick screen on, in this case, public equities that meet their criteria. So they might give criteria on, you know, industry of operation, growth rates, market cap, all that. But in this case, we're looking at ROE and we're controlling risks. So here we're going to include um, a, a, a criteria that requires positive net income. And the reason is because you can see from the other two answers, if you have negative net income and negative shareholders equity, um, which would result from like, you know, lots of uh, retained losses. Then negative net income and negative equity would actually result in a positive ROE metric, which we don't want. Um, so if we ensure that net income is positive, for ROE to be positive, equity must also be positive. One concern when screening for stocks with low price to earnings ratios is that companies with low PEs may be financially weak. What criteria might an analyst include to avoid inadvertently selecting weak companies? So PE, this is you know price per share, and this is earnings per share, right? So this metric PE is actually only related to equity holders and doesn't account for the company's actual capital structure, and like this has no reading on how much debt is in the company. So a company could have low PE, high PE, whatever, but we have no idea on really how financially sound the company is. So we need to combine this with B, something like a you know debt to total assets ratio or debt to equity ratio or something like that, which can show us the leverage of the company and whether or not it has a, a healthy balance sheet. In a comprehensive financial analysis, financial statements should be used as reported without adjustment no, this kind of goes, you know, against everything we've been saying over the last couple of modules about biases in accounting standards and how we have to adjust for them. Um, financial statement should be adjusted for after completing ratio analysis. No, it should be done before so that your ratios are already adjusted. You don't adjust after the fact. And our answer is going to be C, adjusted for differences in accounting standards, such as IFRS and GAAP. When comparing a U.S. company that uses the last in first out or LIFO method of inventory with companies that prepare their financial statements um, under IFRS, analysts should be aware that according to IFRS, the LIFO method of inventory is never acceptable. LIFO is only allowed under GAAP. And it's allowed, it's not required. Um, 
You can do like LIFO, FIFO, weighted average cost, specific identification, all that. But under IFRS, you can't do LIFO. An analyst is evaluating the balance sheet of a U.S. company that uses LIFO. The analyst collects the following data. So we have prior year here and current year here. Um, we have inventory on the balance sheet, the LIFO reserve, and the average tax rate. After adjusting the amounts to convert to FIFO, the inventory balance would be closest to, well, the inventory balance is going to be under FIFO. This is for inventory balances, not COGS. Remember, COGS was different. But for FIFO, it's the LIFO and an inventory plus the reserve. So it would be 600 plus the 70,000, and our answer is C. They're putting the tax rate in here. This is mainly for uh, either calculating the the COGS difference um, or when we're using the accumulated life or reserve to make an adjustment to equity. Um, but in this case, when we're just doing inventory, you just add the balance to the reserve, and that's it. Analysts gather the following, following data for a company. We have their gross fixed assets and committed depreciation in 2000, 2001. The average age and depreciable life of the company's fixed assets at the end of 2001 are closest to what? Well, we can see there was no change in the gross investment in fixed assets, so no capex, which makes this a bit smoother. Um, the average age is equal to the accumulated depreciation over in-year depreciation. So we have 1.6 accumulated at the end of the year, and the change for the in-year depreciation is the difference between the 1.2 and the 1.6, which is 0 0.4. So we get an average age of four years. And we could already, just looking at the answers, we could already cross this, these two off. Our answer is going to be C, but we can calculate the average depreciable life as well. So the average depreciable life is um, the gross book value, so 2.8 over the in-year depreciation, which was 0 0.4, and we got seven years.